Well, we're still in the upper room, and part of Jesus' message is beginning to register, and it's creating great dismay in the disciples' minds. He's going away. He's going to leave us. John 13 and, and verse 33, Jesus had said, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, little children. It's a term of, of tender love and understanding. Jesus knew how these men must be feeling. We are your disciples. We are your followers. You've just washed our feet. Why can't we use those feet to follow you? That's what we've been doing for the past three years. Little children. In a way they were like a little child. Every parent has probably experienced the, the child who upon seeing their father or mother going off to work says, where are you going? Why can't I follow you now? For three and a half years he'd been present with them. Their infallible leader, always there with counsel and, and advice. When they needed explanation of his teaching that they did not understand, they could ask him directly. When they went wrong in their behavior, he would gently but firmly lead them back on the right path. But now, with a feeling of abject dismay, almost panic, he's not going to be there. What are we going to do without him? And this is the section of interruptions. First Peter, then in turn Thomas, Philip, and Judas, not Iscariot, interrupted the discourse with, with questions. And if we just put that out in table form, see where we're going in this section, which is from John 13 and the end there through chapter 14, the chapter breaks are, are arbitrary, then that first part, the prediction of Peter's denial. And the key verse, we could say, uh, they're all key verses really, every word is inspired. But it's a challenging question again. Peter, will you lay down your life for my sake? And John 14, 1 to 3, going to prepare a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And another interruption, this time Thomas. We don't know the way. But I am the way, the truth and the life. Philip's interruption, show us the Father. And you can see how the disciples' minds were working. They wanted something tangible. They were thinking more in literal terms. <coughs> Jesus was trying to lift their minds above the literal to the spiritual aspect. He that has seen me have seen the Father. <coughs> then we have a fairly long section which is dealing with the first time that Jesus mentions the, the comforter, the promise. I will ask the Father. The word is pray there, but it, it really means ask. Jesus didn't need to pray the Father for that. And the pivotal verse of chapter 14 is verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. And we can see what the translators have done there. They've used that word comfortless to match their translation of the word which is translated comforter not a particularly uh, good translation uh, in the sense that it might lead us in the wrong direction of thinking of a comforter as one who soothes or consoles it's more one who stands alongside to help to strengthen and that verse 18 i will not leave you the word is really orphans or fatherless i won't leave you fatherless I'm going to the Father. And because I'm doing that, you'll have that special relationship with the Father. Then, now the section there, which is Judas's interruption about manifesting. How, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us, not to the world? But if a man love me, says Jesus, he'll keep my words and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Very special relationship. And then the, the ending of this chapter, the ending of the section, is about true peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace. Not as the world gives. And that faith 
which was going to be shaken to its very core in the next few hours. <coughs> Jesus says, I've told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe have faith. So in that, that first section, which is really the end of, of John, uh, chapter 13, verse 36 to 38, it's the prediction of, of Peter's denial. But Peter is the first to interrupt this, this discourse that Jesus has started upon. And Peter's mind was upon Jesus' words about going away. Didn't like to hear that. Verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And in the first instance there, Jesus is talking about his death. You can't follow me now. He couldn't join in that death on the morrow. But there was a fellowship of the way in, that Peter would experience, but not yet. His time would come afterwards. Well, Peter, in characteristic fashion, protests, verse 37, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Ah, Peter. <coughs> he meant it, but he couldn't deliver on that. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we all know and have experienced that. And so Jesus answered him, verse 38, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto you, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And then chapter 14 continues the, the discourse at that last supper. The 11 disciples there in the upper room were deeply disturbed. Jesus had announced his betrayal, one of you. And they'd searched their hearts. Lord, is it I? Jesus had intimated his impending death, though he does not state that in, in definitive terms. In fact, it's really only once that he, he makes an allusion to that. I lay down my life. Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Peter's denials have just been foretold. And Jesus has said he's shortly going to leave them. Their troubled and heavy hearts were reflected in anxious faces. So John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. And it's an interesting thing to think about there, that trouble is a thing of the heart. We tend to think of, of trouble, that it's there, it comes from outside, and it does, doesn't it? The, the storms of life that assail us in different ways, that maybe by pain and sorrow, by illness, by the disturbing factors of life that cause us trouble. But Jesus' exhortation here is, let not your heart be troubled. We can't rule the storm. But with the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, and the faith in them, a heart can be at peace, even in the worst of circumstances. And we know that's not an easy thing to achieve. And it's, it's Jesus' exhortation here to them. He knows what they're going to go through in a very short time. And so he says, you believe in God. And in the original, it's not a statement. It's not a statement of, of fact. Although they did believe, yes, in, in God, it's an imperative. Believe in God. Believe in me. We see how Jesus aligns himself with his father there. My father and I, we're working in concert for your sakes, for your salvation. I'm going to my father. That's going to open up a, a tremendous opportunity, a new relationship. But believe, trust. That's his exhortation. In whatever circumstances, trust the father and his son. The next three chapters that, that we have here, 15, 14, 15, 16, culminating in that wonderful prayer, John 17, record Jesus' assurance to these men who would spearhead the preaching of the good news of the kingdom and salvation 
far beyond the borders of Israel, ultimately. <coughs> and Jesus, in his discourse, repeatedly refers to the coming events as a journey, a journey to the Father. Gethsemane, the trials, the mockery, the humiliation, the, the pain of crucifixion and death were all part of his going to the Father. He was well aware of that route and what he would have to suffer. But the joy was set before him and what an elevating fact that was in his mind. I'm going to the Father. I'm going to be with that Father that I've loved and served all my life. I'll be with him. And that'll be a great benefit for you. It would open out a way of salvation for all true believers. So let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you. And that's this, this next few verses, one to three. Going to prepare a place in my father's house are many mansions. And the word is misleading in modern vocabulary because by definition now, a mansion is a bigger place than a house. I guess this building at one time would have been described as a mansion, <coughs> bigger than a house. But in my father's house are many abiding places, rooms, plenty of space for all of you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also, and whither I go, you know. And the way you know, and the word for know there is the word which means you've, you've known by observation, you've seen it. But the disciples, and Thomas is going to vocalize this, they're thinking in, in literal terms. The way he's talking about some sort of road or, or pathway. No, Jesus is talking about the way to the Father. And part of his assurance is that the Father's got an expansive purpose with the faithful. In my Father's house are many places. And we know that that verse is a rested scripture. It's used to support the idea of heaven going based on the wrong assumption that since God dwells in heaven, well, that's where his house must be. And that's where believers will end up. It's used to support the idea of heaven going. But all references that Jesus has made so far to my father's house are to a place on earth. Now, previously, when Jesus had referred to his father's house, it was in the context of the temple in Jerusalem. John chapter 2, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So naturally, the disciples would think of the literal temple. But that temple was going to disappear. <clears throat> Jesus had said to the Jews, your house is left to you desolate. And to his disciples upon the Mount of Olives, as they look at that magnificent building, Jesus said, not one stone of that building will be left upon another. And we know how literally that came true. The stones are still there at the foot of the foundation wall of what was Herod's temple. God does not dwell in temples made by hands. We know these verses from Isaiah. So well, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build for me? Where is the place of my rest? For all these things hath my hand made, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is a poor and a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. And again in Isaiah 57, for thus saith the high and the lofty one, that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place, but also with him that is of contrite and a humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite one. And Jesus is trying to explain this concept to his disciples, that there is a way in which the Father and the Son will dwell with those who tremble, who respect God's word. And it doesn't depend 
upon possession of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, obviously, is not talking in verse 2 about a literal building, but a spiritual house made up of people. In Hebrews chapter 3, it's God's house who built all things, and Christ is a son over his house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? So in that verse, Jesus says, verse 2, I go, and he's talking about a physical departure, to prepare a place for you. Jesus was going away to his Father to prepare a place for them and all faithful believers in God's eternal purpose with this earth. His present role as high priest on behalf of his people and the direction of the affairs of the nations through the work of angels, are part of his preparatory work on behalf of the saints. Everything that goes on in this world currently and in history has been controlled by God and now by his Son and the providential work of angels. All this confusion and worry about Brexit, we know God is in control. The Lord Jesus Christ, his purpose will be fulfilled. That's part of the preparatory work for the saints to take this world and to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ in God's house, the spiritual household. But first, a necessary and vital part of that preparation was to be his death, to make atonement for sin, to open a way into the Holy of Holies, which no man could enter except the high priest once a year. Jesus' death would not be the end. Whilst it was necessary for him to go away first into death and subsequently into heaven, there is also the promise of return. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Ultimately, Jesus is speaking about his physical return to this earth, we know he will return bodily to reign from David's throne in Jerusalem, a geographical location, and all faithful believers will be gathered together to ever be with our Lord. That where I am physically, ye may be also physical presence. But Jesus is not just talking about a, a, a geographical locality where I am but to a spiritual relationship with him as he has with the Father. In the immediate context of Jesus' discourse, he makes a special promise to these disciples. Verse 18 that we alluded to, I will not leave you fatherless. I will come to you. And here Jesus is not referring to his bodily presence with them, but to the sending of the Comforter, which is identified, mentioned in verse 16 there, and 17, the Spirit of Truth, and in verse 26, it's the Holy Spirit. And this was a special and necessary privilege given to them and to some other believers in the first century for the work that Jesus would commission them to continue in his name. So though Jesus would not be with them physically, they would be aware of his support and his help in this way. It would be almost as if they had the Lord standing there alongside them, which is what the comfort of the word means, really. Alongside to help and to strengthen. Almost as if he's there, but he's not there in physical presence. Jesus had promised them or, or commissioned them at the end of Matthew's gospel, go in, into all nations, teach them, baptizing them. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Verse 4, whither I go, you know, you know by observation and the way you know. Well, 
Philip, uh, Thomas's interruption at this stage, and he's picking up on that word no. They didn't grasp Jesus' meaning that the way he's talking about is a manner of life which they'd seen by observation in him for th over three years. So knowing him and observing that manner of life it should have meant they knew the way. But they hadn't grasped that concept. So it's Thomas that vocalizes it, verse 5. He interjects at this point, and his problem, speaking for all the disciples, is that he's thinking in physical terms of going along a pathway or a road. We don't know where you're going, Lord. How can we know the way? In the disciples' minds, the Father's house was there, existent in Jerusalem. That magnificent edifice that Herod was, was building, extending. How, how then could Jesus talk about going away to prepare a place for them in my father's house? The place was there, surely. This idea of separation from the Lord was unsettling. Thomas was voicing the perplexity which, which they all felt. We, we don't know the way. Thomas, verse 6, I am the way. And the, and the I is emphatic. I am the way, the truth and the life. There's no other way. You've seen it in me. Acts chapter 4, verse, verse 12, of course they understood this later. That there is no salvation in any other, no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus says there at the end of verse 6, No man comes to the Father but by me. I'm the way. And Jesus speaks of, of coming to the Father as an outcome of him going to the Father. The going was, was a physical, bodily ascent after resurrection. They are coming was a spiritual approach in an, a new spiritual relationship. Jesus is the way to the tree of life. He is the way of the tree of life because it is a manner of life that's being talked about. It's by him and, and through him access to the Father and eternal life is graciously provided. And if we want to know that way, <coughs> we must know the Father and his Son. Verse 7. If you had known me, and it's a different word for know now. It's, it's a word which means to know by learning. It's a process of coming to know. P, uh, Thomas, if you'd really come to know me, you would have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. That word see there can mean either see with the eyes or to see with the mind, like a perception. I see the point. But the disciples were thinking about his coming separation from them. Jesus was thinking about man's separation from God and himself as the only one who would bridge that gap. Men must travel that way by him. And Jesus was an illustration of that way in himself by his manner of life, his obedience and voluntary death, his service. For our sakes. And Jesus also refers to himself as the truth and the life. Truth is more than right knowledge, but that's important, of course. It includes motive and action as well. Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 4 here You have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That's another way of saying. That God's character is revealed in Jesus. John, writing later in his, his first epistle, says in chapter 1, verse 6, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, and he's surely making an allusion there to Judas, we lie and do not the truth. So truth is something to be done as well as known and believed. It's a way of life. And Jesus said, 
He is the life. And that follows from the way and the truth. Our mortal life is, is forfeit because of sin. God has provided for us his son, who will bring the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And those three titles together then, the way, the truth, and the life, state the place that Jesus has in God's purpose, both in himself and in relation to others, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Men and women can come to the Father. That verse 7 in Rotherham's translation is rendered, from henceforth are you getting to know him? It is a process, a lifetime process. And you've seen him, is that word, which can mean with the eyes or with the mind. And now it's Philip's turn to, to interrupt. He picks up on that word, seeing, seeing the Father. Verse 8, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. The word show means give us evidence, give us proof. It's not that he didn't believe in God, but he, he wanted something, as did all the apostles there, something tangible, something real, literal to, to hang on to, that they could see. He'd know, of course. No man can see God and live. He'd know that. So what did he expect to see? Was it a visible manifestation of, of God's glory? Like Moses requested, show me your glory. And there he saw. It wasn't so much what he saw, but what he heard was important. On that cave, in that cave of Mount Horeb, Moses was warned, no man can see me and live. Not with the eyes. Moses had also asked a little earlier, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I might know thee. In Psalm 103, it, it does record that the Lord God revealed to Moses his ways <coughs> and his acts unto the children of Israel. And the acts didn't have a lasting impression on many of those. They lacked that faith to carry it through. But Moses and other faithful began to know God through his ways. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is really referring to. It was not so much a lack of faith in those disciples or in Philip that they didn't believe in the existence of God. Of course they did. It was a lack of comprehension, perception. And perhaps we can emphasize what kind of perception do we have in our minds when we think of Almighty God, our Father in heaven. We're not given any physical description of the divine being, deliberately so, nor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel was specifically prohibited from making any graven images or any likeness. And though he has a, a physical existence, and the Lord Jesus Christ sits at his right hand presently, God wants us to think about him in spiritual terms. God is a spirit. To think about what he's like. Not what he looks like. The occasion when Jesus met the woman at the well at Samaria. Of Samaria. The woman of Samaria. Just outside the town of Shechem. With the mountains of Ebal and Gerizim in the background there. And the issue that, that she really wanted to know was where should we worship? Mount Gerizim or down there in Jerusalem? Jesus said it doesn't really matter where the hour comes and, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeks such to worship him god is a spirit and the word is is in italics god of spirit god is spiritual that's the real point and they that worship him must be spiritual worship him in spirit and in truth 
Verse 9. Ah, Philip, have I been so long with you and you have not known me? Uh, That's come to know by learning. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? There was a manifestation of God's glory before their eyes. Fuller, greater, more complete than ever before in a person. They should have come to know that by learning. They'd seen it with their eyes and with their minds, although it hadn't fully sunk in. John, right in the gospel later, of course, would say in John chapter 1, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Father was there in front of them. Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in his only begotten Son the express image of his character. And so Jesus appealed to them in the the verses 10 and 11 and 12 is, think of my words and think of my works. If the words don't convince you, then surely the works must, because... There is no other explanation. They are my Father's words, as we thought about last night. They're my Father's works, and you've seen them. You've heard them. Believe in God. Believe in me. So, we look at this section, which is to do with the the promise of the Comforter. And, And the pivotal verse, verse 80, I will not leave you, fatherless. I will come to you. He said earlier in verse 16, I will pray the Father. And the word is not so much pray in the sense we would understand that. I'll ask the Father. It won't be denied. And he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And that word forever can be a a bit misleading because we naturally think of forever as forever. But it is a word which can be limited. And here it's the Greek word aeon age. You'll have this privilege for a limited time. The age, the Jewish age, was necessary in that first century. They had it for their lifetimes, presumably. And he refers to it as the comforter. It's the word which we've said means one who stands alongside to help and to strengthen. It's called in verse 17, the spirit of truth. It's a personification of the Holy Spirit, as verse 27 identifies it so clearly. Jesus says in verse 25, These things have I spoken with you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. These things have I spoken to you whilst I was present with you. They heard the words. But we all know that human memory is fallible, sometimes very transient. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would give them perfect recall, remembrance of Jesus' words. It would be almost as if Jesus was there with them, standing alongside to strengthen, to help them. It's, it's a word which can also mean an advocate in the court of law. In the, in, the, in the letter of John, which is the only other place that the word actually appears in the New Testament, it is translated as advocate. And it was very true that Jesus had already promised them. When they bring you into synagogues and into magistrates and powers... Take no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. For the Holy Spirit shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. And though they might stand there alone, facing that that hostile body of the Sanhedrin, or later on, as Paul did, the actual kings and rulers of the then known world, as he stood before the emperor of Nero, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll give you The words through the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. You will, in effect, have someone 
though not necessarily literally so, there beside you, your advocate, your strengthener. And the key exhortational point that comes out of this section is there in, in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's repeated in verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. And that leads on to the next interruption. This time it's Judas, not Iscariot, who picks up that word manifest, and he says, in verse 22, How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. And that word there, abode, in verse 23, is not the same word that we found in verse 16. There in verse 16, it's, it's the word which means remain, which can be for a limited period of time. Here in verse 23, it's actually the same word we find in verse 2, uh, verse, is that verse 2? Um, many mansions, yeah. The word mansion, abiding places. And, and that's led to some confusion and wrong ideas about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. People would latch on to verse 16 and say, well, there's the promise. <coughs> of the comfort of the Holy Spirit forever for believers. But Jesus isn't saying that. And in fact, the, the precision of the words is important. He says in, in verse 16, the comforter is given. In verse 26, it's sent. But the Father and the Son will come to those who keep Jesus' words. Verse 16 is a specific promise to those disciples present in the upper room, a necessary helper for the work ahead of them. Other believers in the first century would be granted Holy Spirit gifts, but these men that had been with the Lord from the beginning would carry the extra responsibility as leaders, and some of them would have to witness before the kings and the rulers of this world. Whereas verse 23 is a principle which applies to all faithful believers from all ages. The abiding of the Father and the Son is not referring to any mystical <coughs> indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And again, we note the precision of the language. It's something they will come and make their abode with him, not in him. It's not dependent upon possession of the Holy Spirit. It's an awareness that God and his Son are present in our lives. A classic Old Testament example would be Joseph. Even in prison, when all seemed to be, be lost, how could he ever save his brothers? The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The Lord was with Joseph as he also was with David and other faithful characters. Since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, the exalted Son now shares with his Father that ever-present oversight and care of the believers. They are present in our lives. We are in their hands, Jesus said in John 10, and no one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. We have the unshakable promise, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that special fellowship with the Father and the Son, which we experience even now and look forward to sharing forever in the kingdom, is not contingent upon possession of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't for those men, actually, either. It is contingent upon our love for the Lord and a sincere effort to keep his words. And so we get to the last part in Verses 27 to the end there. 
true peace and faith which comes by hearing. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace, my peace, says Jesus. Peace of mind, because first of all we have peace with God. Through that work of atonement, the forgiveness of our sins, reconciled to God. And peace of mind, whatever the circumstances of life. Verse 28, if you loved me, you've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, well, yes, they did love him. But at this time, their thoughts were, were looking inward. Blinding them to the, the exalted message that he was trying to get them to understand. I'm going to my father. I'm going to be exalted to my father's side. An everlasting, immortal, high priest. Working on your behalf. Preparing a place for you. And his going to the father would mean greater power to help them. Through the Holy Spirit, the comforter. Because my father is greater than I. And I've told you, verse 29, before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe, have faith, because the prince of this world is coming. That's a reference to the Jewish authorities, primarily assisted by the Romans. And that's expanded a little more in, in later chapters. And they've got nothing in me. They would have nothing to accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of. But that the world may know Come to know by learning that I love the Father and the Father gave me commandment. What was that commandment? That I lay down my life for the sake of my followers. That commandment was the Father's gift to the world, which Jesus fulfilled because he loved his Father. Arise, let us go hence. And we presume they left the upper room at that stage. When they'd sung a hymn, the other gospel records tell us that. And that hymn would come from the Hallel, the series of psalms that was sung at Passover. Psalms 113 through to 118. We'd like to finish by thinking about one of those psalms and how relevant it would be to the Lord Jesus Christ's thoughts. As they left that upper room and, and made their way past the temple, possibly even through the temple, though that's debatable, his father's house, <coughs> in a literal sense. Psalm 116. They would have sung this at some stage. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant, I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. In the courts of the Lord's house. Not, not the temple that was there. Existent at that moment in time. But in the household of faith. In my father's house. And there are many abiding places. I go to prepare a place for you.